So a patient recently passes away after having dental implants here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And we're here, we're gonna give some commentary in regards to what we may think may have happened um, and how we can most importantly prevent issues like this from happening in the future. Hi, my name is Dr. Daniel Choi. I'm a board certified periodontist. I'm Dr. Sung Han, I'm a board certified oral surgeon. So um, Dr. Han, I wanted to talk to you today um, in regards to this news clip, kind of get your opinion. You're also not only a oral maxillofacial surgeon, but you're also a trained physician. Let's watch this video clip and see basically what our thoughts may be from, about what may have happened. Sounds good. A Dallas dentist disciplined by the state after the death of his patient is now being sued by the patient's children. The lawsuit contends the dentist should have never performed oral surgery on the 82-year-old woman. Fox News' Lori Brown has the story. Lori. Corey's family members say that they filed the lawsuit in hopes of preventing what happened to their mother from happening to somebody else. No one should be dying from dental surgery like this. Jacqueline Kenlock says her mother, Frederica Bailey, was still full of life at age 82, and she wanted better teeth, a full dental implant, instead of a removable denture. She says, you know, you just don't understand how um, it really alters the way that you eat when you wear a partial, and so she really just wanted to improve her quality of life. In June 2022, at the recommendation of a friend, she made the trip from Sugarland, Texas, near Houston, to Dallas to get the oral surgery from Dr. This is his online introductory video. I am Dr. I am uh, one of the surgical directors here in Dallas, and we do full mouth rehab. Bailey's daughter told me she did not know that Dr. He was reprimanded by the state three years earlier for failing to adequately evaluate a patient and obtain medical clearance from the patient's primary care provider. The state also found in the 2019 case that he failed to end the procedure after observing the anesthesiologist's inability to control the patient's heart rate. If you're thinking about going to another center, don't. A lot of dentists are savants, they think. They place maybe a few implants, maybe a few hundred implants, and they think that they can tackle full mouth procedures. There is a market for it. I absolutely believe that she had many years ahead of her. But the lawsuit says Bailey had sickle cell, a blood cell disorder, and end-stage renal disease. She was on dialysis four times a week. Despite knowing that, the defendants went ahead with the procedure without consulting Ms. Bailey's nephrologist or a hematologist. An expert hired by Bailey's family to examine the case in the lawsuit wrote, Failing to identify the right candidate for IV anesthesia, for traveling surgery, for extensive chair time and post-operative downtime were key faults that ultimately led to the demise of Mrs. Bailey. After her surgery, she had a trip planned with her sisters. She just loved life and they were going to meet up in the uh, Philadelphia area and then they were going to go to D.C. to the museums. Kenlock says her mother's life ended too soon. According to the lawsuit, attorney Jonathan Wharton says Dr. <laughs> failed to get medical clearance from Bailey's specialist before performing the nearly $40,000 procedure. Just days after the surgery, Bailey died. The lawsuit says she suffered a pulmonary embolism as a result of the long road trip home. My words to her, when I found her, I'm looking down at her and I just said, those teeth. All right, I'm just gonna pause it right there. So, um, first of all, we just wanted to mention that, you know, all condolences to the family and this is obviously a tragic incident. Um, my whole point of like wanting to talk about this is how can stuff like this be prevented? Because unfortunately, in our line of like work with what we do, as you saw at the beginning of the video, this patient was saying that you don't know what it's like to be in partials, right? And so as dentists, um, we have patients on a daily basis coming to us begging for, hey, can you do something to help me with my teeth? Whether I am not able to chew, um, eat the foods I would like to eat, maybe even a healthy salad. I've, had, I've heard that many times in my career, um, but also just even like the, the lack of confidence and all these things, for whatever reason, patients are begging to get some sort of dental implant supported teeth. But unfortunately, a lot of our patients that are in this situation that they don't have their teeth, they are in, you know, in, they're more elderly, long story short, right? And unfortunately associated with being elderly, um, there is a correlation with a lot of these patients. Maybe they have diabetes, heart issues, and just, as you know, being a, a medical doctor also, that there's just a huge correlation with when, like, in, like a lot of systemic issues can come together and long story short, can potentially cause complications and or have dangerous outcomes, just like in this case. 
So, um, you know, you being an MD also, I want to get your take in regards to what you think about what happened here. So yeah, uh, just to summarize, it sounds like the patient, again, my condolences, passed away due to a pulmonary embolus. Now, what that is, elderly patients or, or patients who are more likely to um, have a blood clot, uh, these tend to form in your lower extremities. Mm -hmm. And if that travels to your lung, think of it uh, as just like it sounds, a, a, a clog. And if that happens in your lungs, that's what we call a pulmonary embolus. Right. And, and if, if that blood clot were to travel to your head, that's what we call a stroke. Right. In her case... Also, what really complicates things is the fact that she's on end-stage renal. Mm -hmm. These are patients who go every other day to a hemodialysis center. I'm sure you right. definitely had patients who... Like the Vita Dialysis Center, right? right? right. Yep. Or, you know, I'm sure a lot of our audiences, they probably know someone who has to go to a dialysis center or a uh, go to what we call a peritoneal dial dialysis where they do it at home. Mm -hmm. Regardless, very sick. This is where we have to think about risk mitigation. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have to really communicate super well with our other specialist colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, in her case, I'm sure she had a nephrologist on board that was uh, taking care of uh, her dialysis measure. Who's a kidney specialist. Kidney specialist. Right. That's correct. Right. So just to not to interrupt you, but basically in our line of work, we have patients that may have heart issues, which is, it seems like that's the most common. So you want to consult with a cardiologist if they're chronically on dialysis than nephrologists, the kidney specialists, as you mentioned. What about patients that have hormonal issues, right? Endocrinologists. Correct, correct. So in this case, like what you're saying is like, we need to consult like to the specific specialist that correct. treats these issues. That's correct. And in her case, uh, the news also mentions that she had sickle cell. Not sure if it's trait or disease. If it's disease, uh, very fatal, I'd say. Um, and she probably then also has a hematology. It's a blood. Right. Uh, definitely would uh, need their take on how to go about managing the patient because you have to think about a lot of things, not only preoperatively, intraop, and also postoperatively. How right. are you going to manage their pain? How long are you going to keep them in your chair for surgery time? Right. Those are all things you definitely need to consult with your. So, could we focus on that? Because I don't think patients really understand this. Um, my gripe with all on four dental implants is as much as I love all on four dental implants, I'm very passionate about it. Um, I think it sends, um, a, there's a lot of marketing out there, especially from these large corporations that like a super simple, easy process, um, not risky at all. Right. But when you're performing these surgeries on a daily basis on these elderly patients, we could tell you that, you know, I mean, I'm sure you feel the exact same stress when we're going through these procedures. Right. Uh, we obviously as dentists, when, again, when patients are coming in, they're begging us to get teeth, to be able to chew again, to be able to smile again. We would love to help them to, you know, have, you know, what they're looking for. Then we see like, hey, I've had like a heart attack like a few years ago. Um, even if they are cleared by their cardiologist and number one, that would be the first step that we have to do, right? We get the clearance from the, um, any necessary clearances that we need from the specialist, their medical doctor specialist, right? But even when we have them, these patients in our chair, these patients are typically in our chair all day, right? Um, now, with all on four, um, typically in every center is different. Some patients may be there all day because they're getting their teeth that same day. Um, some patients may be there for a three to four hour surgery, depending on how fast the surgeon is, right? Um, and they may then may be sent home and get their teeth the next day. But you brought up a very important point. Not only are we worrying about um, you know their vitals, we're recording their EKG, we're recording their blood pressure, their pulse, all these things to make sure that the patient is stable and healthy while they're sedated, while we're doing this procedure. But the other risks associated are, you know, the pain management afterwards, right? So what ends up happening when we have these patients in our chair is that if they're sitting in our chair another four or five hours while our digital design team is designing the teeth and we're printing the teeth and the prosthodontist is sitting the teeth in our mouth, um, we also need to anesthetize their, their mouth, right? So that's another major risk factor that comes into play, right? Where a patient, we can only give them so much painkiller or um, basically locally anesthetic because the body can only handle so much, right. right? So these are a bunch of different factors that kind of come into play when you were just, you know, bringing up like, hey, what what is this, the next 48 hours look like for this patient, sure. right? Sorry, I just didn't want to interrupt your train of thought, but, thought, but those are all different factors that kind of come into play Correct. whenever you're dealing with somebody who's in their 70s or 80s, Correct. right? And I think that's why it's so important to distinguish ourselves from, let's just say, a technician. Well, we're not just going through uh, 
this thing just because we do it every day. Oh, I mean, there has to be a thought process behind every single patient that you see. You know, as far as well, I was talking about risk mitigation, I mean, not every patient is the same. In her case, uh, for those who aren't uh, too familiar with uh, patients with end-stage renal disease, again, hemodialysis, imagine having all your blood sucked out and then re-put it through a machine. Very tiring. You have to think about um, not only your electrolytes. I mean, you have to think about the blood thinners that they're receiving to um, uh, prevent them from having a blood clot while they're getting this. I mean, just imagine that. And then having to go through this long surgery for an 82-year-old. So you also mentioned an important th thing about, um, so dialysis patients are on blood thinners, right? So when we were doing all of our dental implants, there's different arteries that are inside, you know, your mouth and your, you know, your oral cavity, this whole area with your bone. I mean, one of the issues, and that's a whole, that's a conversation that for another day, right? right? We were just talking about that blood thinners in, in surgeries when you're taking out someone's teeth, but also drilling into their jaw, right? Line, right? So, um, again, that's another conversation for another day, but there's so many risk factors that come into play that you know, my whole goal of this video is like, how do we prevent issues like this from happening again, right? And my other thing too is that I want to very, very like reemphasize, like I think, um, you know, the media is what the media is. And um, I know like a lot of times they can make it sound like, you know, they're they're trying to attack and stuff like that. Um, and in no way do I want people to ever, ever think that I'm trying to attack, like in this case. And if anything, again, I want the public to know that we are, I can totally see where this guy's coming from. Someone might sit there and say, why are you trying to do dental implants on somebody who's 82 years old, right? A lot of times patients, or I mean, people in general, we have a tendency to live as, you know, how long your parents or grandparents may have lived, right? In your golden years, in the last, let's say 10, 20 years of your life, if we're telling somebody, hey, we're just gonna slap these dentures in your mouth that are just a prosthesis that looks like plastic that's shape is it's plastic that's shaped and colored to look like your gums and teeth should try to function with that yeah. you're literally taking all the joy as this patient had said out of the remaining years of her life because they can't eat anymore and we can also make an argument that if you can't eat the foods that normally would keep you healthy for example i've also heard in my career many times where patients were dying to eat a salad again right mm -hmm. i had a patient tell me recently that the first thing she did after she got her zirconia teeth is she wanted to eat a salad again you know and she was you know looking forward to that to take that joy away, you know, I'm traveling this summer. I tell people, I tr I design my vacations around eating, right? So if I wouldn't be able to eat again, I would be very, very upset. I know you love to eat, right? I'm a big foodie. Yeah. yeah, you've been in Dallas yeah. for a few months and yeah. all we ever talk about is restaurants, it's right? Exactly. So, so, I mean, I, I want the people out there and like, you know, anybody that's considering this or if anyone's trying to take an angle against this dentist in particular, is like, I could see where he's coming from. He wants to be able to deliver somebody a beautiful set of teeth that they can function with and be able to chew with, you know, in her golden years of life. I mean, she sounded like she loved life. She was excited to go on vacation after her trip. Mm -hmm. And also like with as many procedures that we do, whether dental implants, all on four, whatever it is, when you see how happy these patients are and how fulfilled they are, it also gives us fulfillment when we're able to do these procedures. For them. At the other side of it, we also have to consider the very tragic consequences that could happen, Correct. right? Correct. And we, don't sleep easy at night if obviously like just, you know, and I, I tell patients too, like, I mean, like colleagues also, like when I know I ha I'm heading into a surgery, you know, as a periodontist, the vast majority of my patients are 50 and above, right? So to statistically speaking, we're talking about patients that just have more health issues, mm -hmm. right? We, uh, you even mentioned, um, not 10 minutes ago before we started filming, you brought up a statistic about you know, the blood clots and discontinuing blood thinners before surgeries, right? Would you care to share that actually real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, I did a quick literature search. Uh, there are not that many, but as far as w when they were looking into patients who were on anticoagulants. So blood thinners. For blood thinners. Right. Yeah. When they had stopped the, that for more than three days, it turns out that they had some kind of uh, blood clot event, not a full blood stroke or a pulmonary embolism, but just a blood clot. Statistics came out uh, to be somewhere between 0 0.059 to 1%, depending on which literature you read. Now, to put that to perspective, that's one out of 1,700 patients who are on blood thinners. Or one out of 100. Oh, I mean, one, or, or other than, yeah, you know. that's right. 
On the lower end, yeah, it yeah. would be one out of seventy hundred. On the higher end, it would be one. Out of 100. That's that's scary. That's, that's like scary. yeah. Exactly. So to give my opinion, uh, in my perspective, I personally do not try to stop their anticoagulants because, again, it all boils down to risk mitigation. I can manage some bleeders. During Absolutely. The yep. On the other hand, I'm not going to be risking someone's life. Right. I actually share the exact same opinion. I have one exception. Aspirin, adult dosage. So aspirin, 325 milligrams. Can't stop that bleeding. It's just, they, they just bleed like crazy, right? So in my career, you know, um, what I found in, you know, I actually noticed in residency, like it's some of these patients, you know, back in the day, I know a lot of patients were on Coumadin, but they just, it almost seemed like they had thicker blood than your average patient. And then um, just the risk of, you know, uh, like pulmonary embolism, uh, you know, stroke, whatever it was. It For me, like the way I practiced throughout my career is that, um, and I even had some physicians, they would say, because that's normally a blanket statement. Hey, you're going to have some sort of oral surgery procedure. We want you to discontinue your Coumadin X days before. I actually have told my patients, hey, just stay on it. And luckily, you know, knock on wood throughout my career, I haven't ever seen a patient bleed, like, you know, significantly. Um, but that's a little off topic. But anyways, so I, I could see exactly where this was well-intentioned. And unfortunately, this was a, a tragic incident. But um, actually, let's continue this video and then let's like finish it up. Ken Lai says her mother, a retired nurse herself, trusted Dr. with her life. They should have known better. They should have contacted, knowing that mommy was on dialysis, they should have contacted her nephrologist. The state board of dental examiners found Dr. violated the minimum standard of care by failing to consider the length of the procedure and the length of Bailey's long trip home. And he also failed to consider a hospital setting given her age and medical conditions. What are your thoughts about what they just said right there? So I unfortunately will have to agree. Yes, they're absolutely right. Any surgeries, prolonged surgeries, sounds like that on top of a long trip home. Yes, you can get a blood clot and have to, have to, have to consider that into your you know risk mitigation as far as getting the surgery done. Yes, definitely a uh, top tier nephrologist because like I told you, hemodynamically, you have all these variations and you want to make sure that all the uh, blood work, that's one of the things that we ask the nephrologist for is, is the most recent blood work. Have to make sure that that's okay. But yeah, absolutely agree with, um, with what they stated there. Yeah. Okay. What we can do is send a message to and to every other dental practice out there that there is a minimum standard of care, that they have to comply with it. I reached the attorney for Dr. He told me the firm does not provide responses for matters in litigation and added Dr. plans to defend the lawsuit vigorously. The other party named in the lawsuit, Frontline Dental Implant Specialist Inc., doing business as has not responded to my multiple requests for comment. I don't want another family to have to go through what we've gone through. Dr. was ordered to pay a $4,000 fine by the state, but he is still allowed to practice with a probated suspension on his license. So I do want to take this opportunity to actually talk about all of her surgery and sedation. Mm -hmm. I do think that patients in their mind think, and I've uh, no blame to them, think that it's actually the all in four surgery uh, that they think is scarier, but it's actually the opposite. It's actually the sedation part that you should be really thinking about that could potentially lead to some of the more serious complications. Just to give her case as an example, if you have end-stage renal disease, you have to think about that your kidneys are no longer functioning to really clear out the drugs that you're being given. Um, lots of times you'll see that they're a whole lot more sedated than, than they need to. So for, for um, our clients and patients out there, I do definitely uh, think that you have to give uh, big considerations as far as when you decide to go to sleep for these to, to really think about the possible consequences. Because um, sometimes, yeah, we end up having more issues with the anesthesia part than actually the surgery, believe it or not. So just to reemphasize, the status of your liver and your kidneys has a huge impact in regards to how you clear your drugs. That's absolutely correct. Usually they stay longer in your system, but you can't metabolize them. Uh, you tend to see that they're more sedated and just take longer for them to recover. Mm -hmm. um, what I think that you wanted to talk about was the fact that uh, they mentioned something about possibly taking this case uh, to a hospital uh, mm -hmm. setting. 
Uh, for those who uh, never had surgery done in a hospital setting, a hospital setting is very different from what uh, we do here in an outpatient setting. Basically, if something bad were to happen, you do have the emergency room available right, right there. You do have other specialists, such as your emergency doctor or your cardiologist, whichever specialist that you need, depending on what kind of uh, serious complication that you can endure especially for people who are undergoing chemodialysis and have chronic kidney disease that let's just say that is you know not too uncommon for something more serious to happen after uh, and we're not just talking about all on four dental implants we're talking about if you had a, a compromise i mean you're compromised in some way severe medical issues then you need to consider an outpatient i mean a, a hospital setting sorry absolutely and that is only if you are considering um, sedation yeah. because um one way had this patient come to me, I think one of the options that I possibly would have considered was to do this under uh, just local anesthesia with Foley Lake. I know it's not the most ideal right. option for yeah. from the patient perspective. Yeah, it sounds but, pretty yeah, brutal. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound brutal. But, yeah. but as you saw here, one of the things that they mentioned is, is long chair time. Uh -huh. One way to really you know go about handling that is to perhaps stage certain procedures, mm -hmm. whether it's placing one or two implants mm -hmm. per visit yeah, and, and just really taking it in steps yeah. versus just trying to get everything done at, at, at one go. Right. Um, anytime, um, and similarly that what I've seen in the past also is that I've had some patients in the past where they, even though we get rid of clearances, no offense, the age and just some things that may um, just stress me out, long story short, I'll sum it up as that, stress me out a little bit more than your average Let's say you got a healthy 50 year old guy that's like running marathons, you know, for an all of war type of surgery, or for example, you know, they're on blood thinners and we know that we shouldn't discontinue in that case. I've told patients and I like, and I was like, listen, listen, again, you need to understand that we're looking at your best interests at heart. We know you want the teeth. I want you to have the teeth. I want you to also be alive here a year from now. Right. So, and I've had patients actually take this in a negative way because they're upset. I, I tell them ahead of time, like, listen, I may only do one arch, right? If your blood pressure gets out of control, you start bleeding more than normal, whatever it is, and we just deem that it is not safe for you to continue to go proceed with the surgery, we're just going to call it. Now, I understand that you're coming here, you're taking time off work, you want to recover a few days after, and you want to get everything done. Um, but having practiced for so long, I've had patients actually be upset at me after the fact, yeah. right? But I mean, yeah, patients just need to understand we do have your best interests at heart, right? you passing away after a surgery like this is obviously not good for you. It's not good for your family. It's not good for us, you know? So um, I think that one take home lesson from a case like this is that I think patients just really need to like understand that when you decide to work with someone, you need to work with somebody that you trust and just like, and just don't question them in regards to like, you know, big decisions that you may have to make right on the scene, right on the spot. Right. right? I don't think anyone should be doing dental surgery at the cost of things. Right. Um, because like you've mentioned at the end of the day, what good are teeth for if you got stuff? And, and we're like, we're not even talking about death. What about a severe stroke? Yeah. Right. Um, severely compromising situations. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about then is like, um, what are your conversations like before, you know, like at a consultation before proceeding with something like this? Is there anything else that you tell patients? In a procedure like this, um, other than the implants and the uh, final prosthesis that we're going to deliver, I put a heavy emphasis on the sedation mesh. Mm -hmm. For uh, my on four cases, I actually do my own sedation. Mm -hmm. Somewhat unclear whether uh, uh, this was the case for this. It sounded like they had an anesthesiologist from my understanding. I drill into them um, the the seriousness of safe mm -hmm. anesthesia. Because as I've told you, the more serious complications, bad things happen from anesthesia gone wrong mm -hmm. rather than surgery gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Things that have gone wrong in surgery are all amendable. Mm -hmm. Things that go wrong during the anesthesia portion are sometimes irreversible. Mm -hmm. So I do put a heavy em emphasis on safety. Um, and that's usually where most of my compensation lies is, is the modality of how the surgery is done, mm -hmm. uh, whether being fully awake, whether they want to get everything done all at once. And you're not just talking about all of them. You're talking, talking about all you're talking about everything. Any kind of yep. Thing. Sometimes we kind of abstract the middle ground of, of a more uh, safer option, such as uh, nitrous oxide, mm -hmm. um, laughing gas, uh, as as the public knows. Um, anything past that, where we say anything from what we call twilight all the way up to deep sedation. Uh -huh. At the end of the day, it's a spectrum. Uh -huh. There's no formula out there that will tell you 
giving this much um, of, of a certain drug will put you at this state, given what it is a spectrum. Uh -huh. But yeah, to answer your question, I do put uh, a, a, a lot of emphasis and lot, lots of time as far as a lot of things that we should do. Love that. In a case where a patient has um, some sort of medical compromise, what pre like operative assessments? So before we do the surgery, before we say we're going to take you on as a patient, do you have like what are your pre-operative assessments that you need before you're going to go ahead and say, hey, we're going to do this? Uh, to give uh, this specific patient as an example, for someone who has chronic kidney disease, as you know, the kidneys think of them as almost your final filter, and lots of times when they have uh, something wrong with the kidneys. Um, other organs are affected also, mainly the heart. So in her case, I wouldn't be too surprised that she also has a uh, cardiologist on top of the cardiologist. Mm -hmm. Other things that I would ask for are uh, certain lab values. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, when someone from the blood tests and urine tests, tests, exactly. Yep. When they undergo hemodialysis, again, your blood is entirely sucked out and re <laughs> so The quality of life is compromised. Compromised. Yep. So Again, electrolytes are all over the place. Mm -hmm. pH, your acidity of your blood is all over. So mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, I, I request uh, from the nephrologist for these cases is the most recent lab result. Because by rule, they have to draw labs after they undergo hemodialysis. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that can go wrong, especially, is your potassium level. And that can lead to uh, serious problems. Other than uh, these blood tests that check your electrolytes, other things I check are uh, certain uh, blood cell levels, mm -hmm. um, such as your white blood cell, mm -hmm. might off infection, right. and uh, also your platelets and your uh, red blood cells. Your kidney, believe it or not, uh, produces enzyme called erythropoietin that helps you with red blood cell well, uh, applications. So all those levels have to be at a certain level for me to feel comfortable. Right. So to sum it up, because that was just this case in particular, right? Every patient is different. So long story short, we need to contact every like, specific specialist for whichever condition that this patient has. Correct. Right. We need the clearances before we can proceed for the Correct. procedure. Correct. Right. For the safety of this patient. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention about this case? Yeah. Um, I don't want uh, the, uh, uh, the seriousness of our talk. Uh, deter people out there who have end stage real disease mm -hmm. uh, from ever getting um, implants. What we're trying to say is it, it doesn't mean just because that you have end stage renal disease that you either have to uh, get your implants done in a hospital setting or not able to get implants, period. Again, like we've, uh, we have discussed, there are options uh, where you can get them while you're fully awake, perhaps not the most ideal, but again, it's safety or even with laughing gas. So just don't want people to think that it's all good. Yeah. So just precautions need to be taken. I think my uh, final thought on this is that when I saw this, um, it's tough. It's tragic. I totally see where both sides are coming from, right? We have a uh, a patient. You could just look at her her photos. She looks like she's full of life. She looks like a nice woman. She just wanted to be able to smile and eat again, right? right? Not have to wear partials or dentures in her mouth. She felt that having teeth was going to be a huge boost to her life. Unfortunately, um, medically speaking, she was just in a really compromised state, you know. Um, and a case like this, for me personally, I would have steered away from and, you know, told a patient, hey, maybe you might need to find another provider because I wouldn't be able to sleep a week heading into this procedure, you know. Obviously, um, you know, our typical protocols are, again, going and getting the um the clearances from the necessary medical specialists. Um, I think one key thing that needed to be mentioned, I did a little bit more research into this, um, but they were saying that one of the biggest issues legally, why this got to this point was because um, they didn't get the medical clearance from the specific, from this, the, nephro the nephrologist. So we could sit there and say like, well, what, what can we learn from this case? Something that they were bringing up is apparently there was some maybe some sort of um, dispute in regards to um, somebody wasn't told about what medical procedure, dental procedure they were doing. I think there was a little confusion as to the time of the procedure and all what all was happening because there could be a huge difference between a clearance for taking one tooth out that's causing this patient an infection versus like a four-hour surgery, three to four-hour surgery, and a patient may be sitting in the chair even longer, um, maybe a large like volume, uh, loss of volume of blood um, or 
medications that need to be administered after the fact or just the stress of going through a, a much larger procedure. There was conversations that I've had with certain individuals that know more about this case that they were saying that that was a, a dispute also. You know, again, I, I totally see where this, this doctor was coming from and like what was, he was hoping for the patient. But unfortunately, like this patient was in a medical, was medically compromised. It, it's, it's, this is kind of like a touchy subject, I really feel, because um, a lot of our patients are elderly, mm -hmm. you know? And again, all these patients come to us in desperation because they want help for these types of procedures. We got patients also that are not coming in for implants. They just have a massive infection. And we're sitting here, we're like, well, I got this clearance, but you're still like, you know, like making me super nervous. Um, unfortunately, I refer them all to you. <laughs> you know, but I mean, but that's the reality of what we are, right? Like we are as a specialist, we get all these cases referred to us from other practices where they feel that that patient is just, you know, they, they don't want to touch that patient. They refer them to us. And so then we have to, you know, deal with these stressful cases too. And then the other side of it is this patient has a massive infection and there is actually cases documented where patients can develop uh, brain abscesses, have strokes due to these, you know, these oral infections, right? Like we, we've seen cases like this. So um, I think we get stuck between a rock and a hard, like a hard spot, like, be, you know, just being in these situations with these patients, we obviously want the best for them. But it's also very stressful for us, you know. I, yeah, you know, you're smiling at me, and I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm also like, I, I, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to like, you know, I, I don't want people to get the wrong like image. Like, we want to go out there and help these patients out. Like these, the other situation is like, like these cases stress us out, and but I think it's so easy to condemn after the fact too, right? But I'm sorry, but we, what we, all I, all I have to say is you shouldn't feel like your dentist is punting this to someone. They're referring you to a specialist because they are very concerned about oh. your state. They know that this is out of their hand, out of their sort of expertise. Mm -hmm. They are concerned about certain scenarios. If you think about that, and perhaps that is exactly why they're referring you to a specialist. Once they get to me, I somewhat go through a similar thought process where I go through um, whether or not I can tackle this here at our dental office, uh -huh. or if this is something so blown, you know, out of proportions where it does have to be taken care of in a bigger hospital. So uh -huh. at the end of the day, it all comes down to risk mitigation. Right. And and, and I think we, we, we drilled on this topic uh, yep. quite multiple times during our talk here, but yep. again, safety, safety, safety. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed our little conversation here but uh we'll be talking about other topics too right we've already discussed um some other topics we want to talk about in the future so all right we look forward to seeing you guys soon and if you guys have any questions comments please feel free to leave them below thanks